Air Force Global Strike Command Airmen conducted an operational test launch of an unarmed Minuteman III ballistic missile to demonstrate the readiness of the U.S. nuclear forces and provide confidence in the lethality and effectiveness. There are over 400 nuclear-armed Minuteman missiles deployed across the U.S. today, scattered in silos throughout the high plains. They have a range of 8,000 miles and are ready to launch at a moment's notice. If you were to see one, or a hundred of them, leap from their underground hiding places up through these amber fields of grain, then they would not have performed their true role, and we would have failed to keep the peace. In the world of espionage, the past is never truly past. And that's doubly true for the case of James Harper and his tale of nuclear spying. Over 40 years ago, he provided secret information to Moscow's allies about the U.S.'s Minuteman arsenal, weapons that are still in use today. And the threat of nuclear war hasn't disappeared either. We're entering a new era in nuclear weapon history. has abstained from a vote of the United Nations on a treaty banning nuclear weapons. Russia. That's Russian President Vladimir Putin. Putin ordered Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. And now, experts believe a potential confrontation between the nuclear superpowers is at its highest point since the Cold War. Global catastrophe has been set worse than any other time, even at the height of the Cold War. That fall, President Biden warned of a, quote, direct threat of nuclear war for the first time since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Vladimir Putin is becoming embarrassed and pushed into a corner. And I wonder, Mr. President, what you would say to him. Don't. It will change the face of war, unlike anything since World War II. Say there was a nuclear exchange between the U.S. and Russia. Those same Minuteman missiles would be a core part of it. In the 1980s, the director of the FBI called Harper's spine, quote, comparable in severity to the passage of atomic secrets by Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. The Rosenbergs were World War II era spies and were executed for espionage. Their spine is considered among the most damaging in U.S. history. We don't know for sure if the secrets Harper sold might still help Moscow today, but Nuclear espionage cases, it's clear, can have decades-long shockwaves of their own. I'm Zach Dorfman. From Project Brazen and PRX, this is Spy Valley. Episode 3, Get As Much As You Can. Harper and I had begun chatting. First, exclusively, about his young life in the Bay Area and his early business exploits in Silicon Valley. This is Harper. So uh, so what I wanted to ask you was for you to just tell me... But after he got a bit more comfortable with me, his initial reticence to talk about his espionage seemed to melt away. <laughs> I got a little bit busy this afternoon and I, uh, I pulled that stuff out and it's, uh, it's exactly what I thought. It's uh, uh, details that... Um, I'd probably never be able to come up with it's it's good material, and uh, soon enough, uh, uh, Harper's story of spying for the Soviet bloc poured out of him. He became voluble, almost eager to recount details large and small about his case. He even started putting together a bunch of documents for me about his spying. Yeah, hi Zach. I've uh, I've been uh, working on uh, reviewing that stuff that I uh, I suggested sending to you. I completely reconstructed that first page 
out of the classified documents safe. Harper even went from being tight-lipped about his spying to being upset at himself when he couldn't recall every single moment of it. I can't remember the, the names. It was some guys that... Uh, mm. uh, it was some old... Oldest Meanwhile, I was trying to hunt down every bit of evidence I could find on Harper's case. I identified boxes and boxes of never-before-seen court exhibits and filings stored away in San Francisco. And I pestered federal court clerks until they let me copy them. I located a massive tranche of partially declassified documents on the Harper case sitting in government storage in Oregon. They were already past their destroy-by date. And I begged clerks to find a way to ship them to San Francisco so I could scour them before they were incinerated. Honestly, I became a little obsessive. I worked painstakingly with a researcher in Poland to locate other files, thousands of pages of declassified, Cold War-era Polish intelligence agency documents, including those of our main characters, Harper, Hugel, Zihojin, and Caribou. You see, to really understand the story, I figured I needed to know what Warsaw's then KGB-aligned spies thought of it. But... Ultimately, this tale of international espionage and betrayal would center on one man, James Harper. And for Harper, that story started with love, or something like it. The year was 1979. Harper had discovered that his girlfriend, Louise Schuler, had access to a trove of ballistic missile secrets through her job. And I said, Jesus Christ, she's working right in the middle of a berry patch for me. So um, I, I got to think, well, I'll find out what the hell she's got over there. And uh, I gave her some guidelines on what to look for. She started looking for stuff. And I, I'm looking at it and, and kind of sorting it out and one thing and another. I said, Jesus Christ, I bet you I, bet you I, I can sell this to the Eastern Bloc through, um, through Hugel. That would be Bill Hugel politically connected Silicon Valley bigwig. Hugel was that pioneer in the field of semiconductors and longtime agent of the Polish intelligence services. Harper had already occasionally helped Hugel, but this was a much bigger score. Of course, you know the routine with, uh, at that time I'd been doing some stuff with Hugel. Hugel was facing several federal investigations into his illegal trade with the Eastern Bloc. So he decamped to Europe for a bit. And I contacted him, and uh, I told him that I had some stuff that was related to ballistic missile defense, and uh, I think maybe you might be able to sell it for me. So Hugel and Harper settled on meeting in Europe in July. And Harper had a good alibi, too. He used family vacation as cover planning on uh, spending uh, two or three weeks over there. I said, well, while I'm over there, I think I'll see if I can hook up with uh, Bill and uh, show him what I've got, and we'll take it from there. Let's see, where the hell was it? He was going to, oh, he was going to be in Geneva. Harper met Hugel in Geneva. They discussed what Harper could offer the Poles, and Hugel agreed to relay the conversation to his contacts in Warsaw. So, if you haven't figured it out already, James Harper was not a trained intelligence operative. And one thing you'd never expect of a spy would be that he'd take notes on a criminal conspiracy. But that's precisely what Harper did. He kept a diary. Here's what he wrote about his Geneva trip. Arrived Geneva 9.30 to meet Hugel. Bill and I went to room to talk biz many interesting opportunities. Agreed to return in Eve to phone contact in Warsaw. So-so dinner while Hugel's wife bummed everyone out. The two men split up. Harper returned to Paris to rendezvous with his family. Then he got word from Hugel that Hugel's Polish government contact, Gisław Sihojin, who we met in the last episode, would meet Harper in Warsaw. Hugel would join them. Hugel the Silicon Valley bigwig, told Harper how to sneak the documents into Warsaw. He gave me instructions on how, how to bring what I had uh, with me and come on into Warsaw. He had it set up with, uh, with Prosugin 
So uh, all procedure would know who he was looking for, and he would he would stand by there at customs and just herd you right on in. You never had to do anything but just show up. A quick note. Harper pronounces Sihojin a bit funny, almost like precision. This was something that FBI agents working the case would later chuckle at. But to be clear, we're all talking about the same person here. At their first meeting, Hugo gave Harper the lowdown on who Sihojin claimed to be and who he really was. Uh, Hugo had, uh, he, he said that he was the uh, minister of the machine tool industry. So uh, he, I think he, he actually had two faces, and the other one was a military uh, person, mm. uh, a colonel or something like that. Just a few days after rejoining his family, Harper prepared to fly to Warsaw. Harper's diary reveals the Silicon Valley engineer to be a stereotypically ill-tempered American traveler. Going to Warsaw. I got bumped with no good explanation. Pissed. Returned to hotel and waited. Airport crowds in Europe are right out of a zoo. Harper eventually made it to the Polish capital. Irritated as he may have been, now that he was in Warsaw, he received the VIP treatment. Sihojin met him at the airport, whisked him through customs, and put him up at a luxury hotel. Checked in at Warsaw's most elegant hotel, Victoria Intercontinental, by far the best I've seen in Europe. Talked biz with Bill and Sihojin. Hugo brokered the meeting, but the two Americans were clearly under Sihojin's watchful eye. And Harper was wiped. At the bottom of his diary entry, Harper penciled in a section entitled, Highlight of the Day. When it ended, We'll be back after the break. We're back. Harper woke up the next morning to another day of intensive discussions with Hugel and Sihojin. He and Hugel met in Sihojin's office, but Harper suspected it was all a front. That was all bullshit. At his office, incredibly bare. This huge building was, it seemed, he seemed to be the only occupant. And we sat there and we had a meeting. And uh, that's where uh, I talked with them about what I thought I could supply in the way of missile secrets. Harper told Sihojin that he thought Russia would be keen on the materials, but he didn't want to deal with Moscow directly. Too risky. I took a sample of this stuff with me into that meeting, and Precision, of course, showed a great interest in it. At the meeting, the men struck a deal, a $15,000 payment for the pilfered nuclear dock that Harper had already brought to Poland. That's worth just over $60,000 today. The cash would be split three ways, one-third to Hugel, one-third to Harper, and one-third to Harper's source for the docks, his lover, Schuler, whose role he tried to keep hidden. But Sihojin, in a canny move, playing it cool, told Harper he'd pay the $15,000 at their next meeting, only after his colleagues determined the value of the rest of what Harper could grab. Even though I didn't get paid for that stuff that I had given him on the first meeting, I left the abstract with, with the idea in mind that they were going to look at that and, and determine how much it was worth to them, and they would pay me. Harper's price for all the missile secrets was a million dollars. That's worth over $4 million today. Highlight of the day, according to Harper's diary, learning of good, serious biz opportunities near and distant future. At the Warsaw meetings, both sides were feeling each other out. The Polish spy service was trying to get a sense of Harper's personality, his motivations, his ideology, and his weaknesses. Over time, Sihojin stitched together a classified assessment of this brash Silicon Valley engineer. Here's what he wrote. I think that the asset's only motivation is getting rich quickly. My encounters with the asset lead me to believe that the motivation of obtaining large sums of money 
does not, unfortunately, go hand in hand with a desire to deliver actually valuable documents. In addition to the documents that are crucial, he tries to smuggle in unclassified items that have some informational value, all while placing financial conditions that are non-starters. You see, Harper would mix secret or highly sensitive missile-related documents with unclassified materials. Then he'd try to pass everything off as equally enticing to his Polish spy handlers, all in an attempt to get paid more. But it rarely worked. The Poles also wanted to suss out whether Harper might be a double agent, someone who actually worked for the CIA. They didn't think so. At this stage, we shouldn't assume that this is a provocation. Neither the materials nor the assets' behavior would point to this. The materials are definitely authentic. They don't have any attributes that indicate that they are meant to lure us into a trap or that their purposes are disinformation. Like any good intelligence service, the Poles were building out a dossier on James Harper. They codenamed him, not particularly creatively, Gimo. Description. Balding blonde, always wears dark glasses, heavy, sporty type, casual dress, chain necklaces, etc. Gimo is an intelligent person who easily adapts to his interlocutor and easily goes between joking around and discussing serious matters. He has no psychological barriers with passing on U.S. secrets to the socialist camp. Physically, he is well-built. He likes to and is capable of drinking large amounts of alcohol. Most important personality traits. Heavy drinker, bold, cunning, likes taking risks. If Harper knew how intensely he was being scrutinized, he didn't let on. And he was genuinely fond of Sihojin. He was a, a likable, he was a small guy. He had a good sense of humor, and he would, uh, I, he didn't look like a spy. <laughs> Sihojin never explicitly told Harper, I'm a spy. But there was an implicit understanding between both men about who he actually was. In Harper's recollection, the Polish intelligence officer had a suave and assured demeanor. He had a comfortable way of, of operating. I'm sure he had developed over the years. And, uh, you know, he, he wasn't the, uh, fumbling around with me in his jacket to make sure he had his revolver there. And he got the idea that he, he had a lot of power. I remember at one time uh, you know, on the serious side, he says... You know, we are not playing games. The message was, you know who I am, who we are, and what we can do. This was, after all, a KGB-aligned spy service capable of hurting those who betrayed it. After Harper's first rendezvous in Warsaw, the Poles were hooked. They wanted another meeting and agreed to pay Harper for more nuclear docks. So he returned to San Francisco with a mission. I went back with some general instructions. Basically, just get as much as you can. And then when I came back, I reconnected with Louise and put together a more of a package than I had before. I, I had just kind of given them a sample of what was available. With this lover, Schuler, Harper began systematically pilfering nuclear-related documents from her workplace. Schuler also saw an opportunity to make some cash. You see, she had access to her company's office after hours, and even the combination to her boss's safe, the same boss with whom she was in the midst of a decade-long affair. The code, in fact, was Schuler's birthday. Louise had been given the combination to Larson's secret document file. And then that thing had a, uh, a summary list of what was in it. And she gave me that thing. <laughs> and I, I knew I had a lot of material. And I know damn good and well that that would have sell over there if I get him to him. 
Late at night, Harper and Schuler would sneak into the darkened, empty office. Schuler would open the safe, and they'd take out documents by the bagful. Harper and Schuler would drive back to their apartment and spend the night together, Xeroxing the documents. Schuler would then return the originals to the safe early in the morning with no one the wiser. And that's how Harper, by the end of his escapade, accumulated as much as 100 pounds of missile-related documents from Schuler's office. That's 100 pounds of paper. Meanwhile, Harper and Bill Hugel's relationship was starting to fray. Hugel clearly wanted to keep a close eye on Harper, and he wasn't about to be shut out of the deal with the Poles. Harper, soon after he returned to Silicon Valley from Europe, took to his diary again. Surprise, Hugel is back. He called about 9 a.m. and wanted to meet my place at 10.30. Bill was vague about why he returned. I think it was to keep an eye on my main deal. We discussed everything and agreed to meet his place next day for more detail. They all knew the next steps. The three of them, Harper, Hugel, and Sihogen, met again a few months later in Europe. This time in the notorious Cold War spy capital of Vienna, Austria. Harper landed in October 1979. And he met a favored companion upon his arrival. Well, I found out that Louise was going to Europe herself and was going to be there when her boss was there on a, uh, at, a, at a conference. Harper wanted to keep Schuler's role hidden because he didn't want anyone to know who his source was for the missile documents. So the plan was, while Harper ran interference, Schuler would lay low to preserve her anonymity. Harper checked himself into the Intercontinental Hotel, right in the center of the city. Hugel, laser-focused on his cut, also arrived at the hotel. Sihojin, too. Hugel met Harper in his hotel room, just the two of them. And Harper took out the documents he planned to offer the Poles. Hugel didn't say a word. He turned up the volume on the radio and took out a handkerchief. He held the documents with the handkerchief in order to not leave any fingerprints. Hugel looked them over and agreed that their sale could be very lucrative. The next day, Harper, Hugel, and Sihojin met at a nearby apartment. Hugel was worried about electronic listening devices in their hotel rooms. Over scotch and champagne, Harper produced a master document, a table of contents of sorts. He described the other materials he'd brought, as well as some documents he had already copied back in Silicon Valley. And I had not only the material that we had uh, suggested in the first meeting, but I had a whole lot of other stuff. Uh, I don't know, it was about, uh, oh, maybe three or four inches, uh, of maybe a couple of uh, reams of eight and a half by 11 paper that was abstracts from classified material that I was getting from Louise, and uh, I I phonied it up. It looked good, I'll tell you. Harper was feeling very good about the meeting. Maybe too good. Because he made a brash move. He showed Sihojin a pair of Schuler's sunglasses he had brought with him. And he told the Polish spy that a woman wearing those same sunglasses would soon stop by his hotel room to drop off the documents and collect the cash. Harper was having his source of the stolen files get dangerously close to the action. We had a real, yeah, we had a, a real interesting meeting there. And here's when things went a bit sideways. That's when Persugian stiffed me on the... Uh, Original $15,000. That's the original $15,000 that Sihojin had agreed to pay for the documents delivered to him at that first meeting in Warsaw months ago. I was supposed to get paid at that time for something that I had given Prosugin in that first meeting. And Harper was dead set on getting his share. And Louise went to that room. Sihojin was supposed to drop the money into Louise's handbag. But he didn't do it. Schuler returned to Harper's room empty-handed. 
Sehojin followed shortly after. And the men argued about money while Schuler hid in the bathroom. He came back to our room and said, hey, there's nothing but child's play. Uh, we're not going to give you anything for them. There's nothing but child's play. The Polish intelligence officer told Harper the documents were, quote, worthless as a cold cup of pee. Sehojin was saying, we know you're trying to scam us. Not only are we not going to pay you for the documents you've brought on this trip to Vienna, we're not going to pay you the previously promised $15,000 either. Sehojin left Harper in his hotel room. The Silicon Valley engineer was seething. Harper rushed to find Hugo, who was drinking at the hotel bar. Sehojin had headed down there too. At the bar, Harper told Hugel the news. Sihojin wasn't going to pay them. And Hugel erupted at Sihojin, right in the middle of the crowded bar. He and Hugel actually had a, a real loud, uh, uncensored uh, argument about what was, what was going on. I remember uh, Hugel saying something like, uh, you owe me. You know, like that. And, he, and here, this this place is, this is a big hotel bar, the Intercontinental Hotel in Vienna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a, the spy center of the world. You know, you wouldn't have had to be a, a, a rocket scientist to figure out what was going on. Even for Harper, as bold as he was, this was too much. He watched Hugel and Sihojin scream at each other over a cash payout for stolen secrets in a crowded hotel bar. So he immediately decided to lamb it. I went up to the room and I told Louise, I said, get our shit ready, we're getting out of here right now. And uh, Louise and I went directly to the airport and we got the hell out of there. There are a few possible reasons why Harper's deal with Sihojin went sour. Either Harper didn't provide what he'd actually promised to the Polish spy, so his documents just weren't of any great intelligence value to the Soviet bloc. Or Sihojin was engaging in an epic bluff, trying to falsely devalue the documents to keep Harper coming back, offering more information on the cheap. But in truth, it was a little bit of both. Sihojin was trying to lowball Harper, Though some of the missile-related documents Harper offered weren't sensitive, many were utterly explosive. A gold mine for Moscow spies. Sihojin wanted all those classified documents without paying Harper the one-time million-dollar fee he'd demanded. Either way, after that blowout argument in the hotel bar in Vienna, things had spun out of control. The meeting also caused bad blood between Harper and Hugel, because, according to Harper, they had worked out a contingency plan. Hugel had promised to pay Harper back for the money he was owed, given the risk he'd taken, if the Poles somehow squirmed out of paying up. He would underwrite it if that happened. And when it happened, he just begged off and didn't, didn't give me any money. I, I was kind of pissed at, at, at him because of that. I, I ended up spending a lot of my own money and uh, getting very close to broke at that time. The threads of trust between the three men were fraying even further. Eventually, after the meeting, Harper and Hugel spoke on the phone about their deal with Sihojin. Hugel asked Harper if Louise enjoyed her trip to Vienna. This was a problem even though he had sent her to collect the money at the hotel in Vienna, Harper had purposefully hidden Schuler's identity and role in the scheme from Hugel and Sihojin. Harper believed Hugel's comment was an intimidation tactic, Hugel's way of saying that he knew the real source of Harper's missile documents. And if Hugel had this information, it could be all over for Harper. Hugel and Sihojin could cut out the middleman. Still, Harper was so broke that, back in Silicon Valley, he took Hugel out to lunch and asked him for a $2,500 loan. Hugel gave him $100 in cash. Next time on Spy Valley, 
a desperate Harper doubles down on spying for the Soviet bloc and gets his big payday. Spy Valley is a production of Project Brazen in partnership with PRX. It's hosted, written, and reported by me, Zach Dorfman. Bradley Hope and Tom Wright are the executive producers. The show is produced by Goat Rodeo. To find more of Goat Rodeo's work, go to goatrodeodc.com. The lead producer is Jay Venables. Story editing from Siddhartha Mahanta, Jay Venables, and Max Johnston. Executive producers at Goat Rodeo are Megan Nadolsky and Ian Enright. Creative producers at Goat Rodeo are Max Johnston, Rebecca Seidel, and Ian Enright. At Project Brazen, Lucy Woods is the producer. Georgia G is lead researcher. Mary Angel Gonzalez is our project manager, and Megan Dean is programming manager. Ryan Ho is the creative director. Cover art designed by Julian Pradier. Mixing and engineering by Rebecca Seidel. Music from Goat Rodeo and Blue Dot Sessions. Editorial and production assistance at Goat Rodeo from Isabel Kirby McGowan, Kara Schillen, Jay Venables, and Megan Nadolsky. Polish translation and narration by Hannah Kozlowska. Narration recorded at Outpost Studios in San Francisco. Continue to follow the show wherever you get your podcasts to stay up to date on new episodes. And subscribe to Brazen Plus on Apple Podcasts for exclusive reporting and bonus material. <laughs>